already been talking about some of the truths of the Son of God. And the first Sunday that we started this series, we talked about Jesus being a friend of sinners. Any sinners in the house today? Guess what? You've got a friend. His name is Jesus. We also learned that Jesus came to heal the paralytic and that he came to heal us of our diseases and our sicknesses. And then last week we talked about the fact that we are anointed. I am anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. Amen? Now this morning we're going to turn our attention to the theme of the coming King. In our video clip, we saw that most, if not all, in their generation misunderstood the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem. I believe that that truth is still prevalent today. There are close to 6 billion people that live on this planet, but only a fraction of those people understand that Jesus is coming again. He came the first time riding on a lowly donkey, but the next time Jesus will come, he will be riding on a white horse with the words, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords written on his side. Amen. Today I want to share with you about an event that will take place that will catch the world by surprise. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew. I've listed it there in your uh, notes. And uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. And why don't we stand together for the reading of God's Word. One thing here at Harvest, you're going to get lots of exercise. Matthew 24 and verse 32. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Up until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two will be in the field and one will be taken to the other left. Two women will be grinding with the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Father. Anoint your word today. Quicken our spirits to understand the season in which we live in history. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now tell your neighbor before you're seated, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. The predominant scriptural theme for the coming of the Lord is the fact that it will happen unexpectedly, suddenly, without notice, Jesus will return and set up his kingdom. People will be in a state of shock and wonderment of how fast this event will take place in history. And friends, we might be tempted to grow weary in our faith and expectation of His return. But make no mistake, Jesus is coming again. Unfortunately, history has a tendency to repeat itself. Nobody believed that one day a flood would wipe out an entire human race. The Bible says they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Noah lived in a generation much like the generation that we live in, where the goal of life was gluttony and eating and drinking and getting drunk and giving in marriage. Didn't matter who you married then. Just marry anybody. 
It's no big deal. And although there was a preacher of righteousness telling them of the impending doom, they continued on as if nothing would ever happen. And then the rain began to pour, and the springs began to rise. The ark was built to save lives, but nobody really believed that it would happen. Beloved, you can be assured that if God's Word says something is going to happen, then it's going to happen. Amen. Nobody believed the destruction would come to Sodom and Gomorrah. God foretold of a day when He would wipe out these cities because of their wickedness. And we read in Luke's Gospel, it says, It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planning and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, Fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. And in the very next verse it says, It will be just like this on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Tragically, the world is not taking the second coming of Christ seriously. Yeah. We go on in our lives as though nothing is going to ever happen or change. But friends, God's promises are yes and amen. And His Word tells us the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise up first after that. Those who are still alive and left will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We call this the rapture of the church. And I want every person in this building to know that this event is not only at the doorstep of history, but it's going to happen in a moment's notice. The coming of the Lord will happen suddenly. A snatching away of the saints of God is prophesied in the Bible. And if God's word says it, then you better believe it's going to happen. Yeah. Unfortunately, our world is drunk on the pleasures of sin. And the church is lukewarm in its passion to be ready for the coming of the Lord. The Apostle Paul, or Peter, spoke of this in 2 Peter 3. He says, knowing this verse, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust, saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as though they were from the beginning of creation. The world does not believe a terrible day is coming. The world didn't believe in 1914 a boat called the Titanic would actually sink. It was called the unsinkable ship. And the world didn't believe the Twin Towers could fall flat in only a matter of minutes on September 11, 2001. And the world will not believe when Jesus breaks through the eastern sky and receives His bride unto Himself. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will burn up with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Nobody, and I mean nobody, on this planet will escape this event. And there's no question about God's plan to return to earth. It's a done deal. The greater question is, what do we need to be doing right now to get ready for His coming? Please allow me to share with you three things we need to do in order to get ready for the coming of the Lord. And the number one thing you need to do is you need to give your heart to Jesus. Amen. You need to give your heart to Jesus. Well, maybe you've heard that a hundred times in your life. But have you ever really given your heart to Jesus? Where you said, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Be the King that sits on the throne of my heart. I give you my heart Jesus. God doesn't want to send anyone to hell. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for humans. The Bible says God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
The Lord doesn't want to send anyone to hell. People choose hell because they refuse to accept God's love and turn from their wickedness. We call this sin and rebellion. And the only way to escape, escape God's final judgment is to call upon the name of the Lord. His word says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Friends, do not wait until it's too late to make Jesus the Lord of your life. The Bible says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The fool has said in his heart, oh, I'll wait for tomorrow. But what if tomorrow never comes? Today, today, today is the day of salvation. Just like in the days of Noah and Lot, the coming of the Lord will suddenly happen and people will be left standing outside the ark of His love. This doesn't have to happen. Today you can surrender your heart to Jesus and spend eternity inside the gates of His love. Surrender your heart to Jesus. Another thing we can do to ready ourselves for His coming is number two, we can live godly lives. Live godly lives. Second Peter 3.11 says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? First Thessalonians 4, 7 says, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. And Hebrews says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's not enough to accept God's love and forgiveness and then go on living your life with the same behaviors and habits you did before conversion. I don't call that a conversion. A conversion is when you turn 180 degrees away from the things of the world and 180 degrees towards a loving God. I talked to a man recently. He told me he was on a nine-year drunk. Have you ever been on a nine-year drunk before? God bless you. Since I was on a nine-year drunk before I met Jesus. So I asked, well, what happened when you met Jesus? He said, I gave up drinking. Amen. That's conversion. Yeah. You see, conversion includes both addition and subtraction. Addition and subtraction equals conversion. Why? Because you add Jesus and you subtract self. You add the Holy Spirit and you subtract sin. You add God's love to your heart and you subtract hatred, bitterness, immorality, anger from your heart. You add His holiness to your life and you subtract your unholy habits. Conversion is more than one trip to the altar. That's the starting point. That's the moment you add Jesus to your life. But from that moment on, you begin to subtract the things in your life that are not pleasing to a holy God. Do you have to be perfect? No. Will you fall and stumble? Yes, of course. We all do. But that's when you call out to God again and again. Help me, Lord. Help me, God, become more like you. Holiness is drawing near to God and away from the world. Let me ask you a tough question this morning. If you really believe Jesus was coming this week, how would it affect your actions? If you knew this Saturday, you'd be called home to be with the Lord. Would it propel you to make some changes in your life? Would your conversations and habits be different? Would your attitude change? Would you try to be more loving and patient with people? 
Truth is, we need to live our lives in the light of eternity every day, as if this were our last day on earth. Sadly, the hearts of many have grown cold, and we really no longer anticipate the coming of the Lord. It's like when you were a teenager and your parents left town for a few days. What do you do? Party! And so you party hardy until the day of their return and then you clean up the place. Hear me, many Christians are doing the same thing with God. They just want enough of Jesus in their lives to make them feel saved. But they don't want too much of Him to make them change their ways. Friends, that's, that's religion, not a relationship with Jesus. God didn't save you so you become more like the world. He saved you so that you become more like Jesus. As children of God, we have to live lives of holiness. If we don't, then we'll be knocking on heaven's door saying, Let me in, let me in. But the Lord will say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. We'll be left behind. We'll be left behind. So to get ready for God's return, you must first invite Jesus into your heart. Then you must strive daily to live a life that's worthy of His calling, a life of holiness and godliness. And finally, we need to get the Word out. We need to get the Word out. We must ready the world for His return. If Jesus is the Lord of our lives, then we have a moral and spiritual obligation, a responsibility to share with the world that it's about to be destroyed. If an airplane in 20 minutes was going to crash into this building and I didn't tell you about it and I was the only one that knew about it, whose responsibility would it be for the deaths of everyone that would die in this building? It would be my responsibility. But what would I do? I would do everything in my power to say, get out of the building. A plane is going to crash into the building. You've all got to get out. Friends, a plane greater than anything we've ever seen crash into a building is about to crash into this world. It's the judgment call of God. And we have to get the world ready because it's going to happen. Whose responsibility will it be? <laughs> the rain is coming. The fire is falling. The judgment of God is at the doorstep. And people will be destroyed if we don't tell them. If we don't tell them. It's amazing <laughs> how we talk about the weather. The Diamondbacks, the movies we've seen, we talk about food, fitness, fun, but when it comes to talking about Jesus, we develop instant laryngitis. I can't. We close our mouths and we say nothing. We'll talk about our dogs for hours, but we won't talk about Jesus for one minute. Come on. Come on. I find this odd. Considering all the things Jesus did for us. He's loved us. He sent his God sent his son to our world to forgive our sins. He's given us his perfect peace. But when it comes time to testify for the Lord, we don't have anything to say. We talk and we get excited about everything but the Lord. Huh. That's interesting, isn't it? Aren't you glad you have a preacher that tells you the truth? Yeah. <laughs> it's so much fun telling you that. 2 Peter 3.13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
If you're looking for something special, then it's just about impossible not to share it with others. Oh, oh man, they'll talk about their new truck. They'll bring someone out and say, Ooh, man, look at the color. Look at the wheels. Let me open the hood. Look inside. That's got a V8 in it. Whoa. <laughs> You'll tell a thousand people about your new truck. Ladies call each other. <laughs> You're not going to believe the deal I just got in Coles. 93% off! They about gave it to me! Teens will talk to each other and say, Did you see the YouTube video of the guy picking his nose and then eating his boogers? So exciting! I'd like to watch that all day. We talk about things that excite us and bring us joy. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I wonder what would happen in the body of Christ if everyone started talking about Jesus, that he's coming back, that he's going to receive us unto himself, and we all became aflame with the glory of God. We were just as excited about Jesus as we were our toys, our videos, and our clothes. And why don't we have that priority in our lives? We know where people will spend eternity if they don't find Jesus. I'll tell you why we're so complacent. It's pretty simple. We don't really believe Jesus is coming soon. If we did, our whole lives and priorities would be changed in a moment's notice. That's good. If we really believed it, everything in our lives would be changed. You know, if the people of the Titanic would have obeyed the warnings of a sinking ship, then every light bulb would have been filled to capacity, but most were only filled to 40% capacity. If the firefighters of the Twin Towers would have knew that it would, would collapse on their heads, then they would have never set up a command post on the first floor of a building destined for destruction. If the people of Noah's day had believed that water would cover the whole earth, they would have repented and entered into the safety of the ark. The Bible says, as in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Friends, Jesus is coming. Do you believe it? Are you ready for his return? <laughs> How do we get ready? It's as simple as one, two, three. First, you give your heart to Jesus. Have you invited Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior? I preached at people for over 35 years and it's still amazing to me how someone will Raise your hand and accept Jesus. Some in their 80s and 90s, they'll come to me and say, Pastor, I've been in church all my life, but I never gave my heart to Jesus. Friend, today is the day of your salvation. Give your heart to Jesus. Nobody needs to be eternally separated from a loving God. You can prepare for heaven by giving your heart to Jesus today. Secondly, we must live godly lives. Are you living a life of holiness and godliness? Are you a Sunday only Christian? Are you striving daily to please the Lord? <laughs> Finally, we've got to get the word out. Are you doing everything in your power to let others know about his coming? <clears throat> Whether people accept the good news of the gospel, it's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to get the word out. Your friends at school, the people you rub shoulders with at work, the waitress in the wet restaurant, the buddy at the gym, they all need to know 
that Jesus is coming. It's not a fantasy. It's not a fable. It's going to happen. And we need to warn the world. Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Come now, sweet Spirit of God, ready your bride. Thank you, Lord. Take these moments, sweet Spirit, to challenge our hearts, to renew our focus, to put our eyes on the things that mean the most to you. Lord, you would not that anyone would perish, but that all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. So I pray, Holy Spirit, prick every heart, touch every mind, every feeling and emotion, whatever it takes to get us ready, God, to be in that place where we're right with you and we're doing right by you. As your heads are bowed today, you'd say, Pastor, I need to give my heart to Jesus. I've heard about Jesus all my life, but I have never given my heart to Jesus. Not 100%. I'm sure, I've said, Lord, you can have this and you can have that, but I have never 100% surrendered my life and heart to Jesus. If that's you, friend, today is your day. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I've never done that. I've never, yes, thank you, friend. God bless you. Anyone else want to join these that are raising their hands? I want to give my heart to Jesus. You might also be here today and you gave your heart to Jesus. Right now you're struggling. You're struggling following Him. Matter of fact, temptation and trial and trouble is greater in your life than your ability and desire to follow Christ. But today you say, Pastor, today's the day. I'm going to renew my vow to God. I've not been living for God the way I ought to. But I'm going to give my heart back to Jesus. That you slip your hand up right now and pray for you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, friend. And how many of us would say, Pastor, I'm not really living a godly life. Matter of fact, I'm living the self-life. It's all about me and mine. It's all about my toys and treasures. It's all about my pleasure. You're not living a life for God. You're living a life for self. Today, the Spirit of God has touched your heart. He said, don't do it anymore. From now on, I want you to live a life of godliness. If that's you, you want to repent today, you want to surrender your whole heart to Jesus, I want you to slip your hand up. Say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not living a life of godliness. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, friend. Thank you. And I suspect if you're like me on this last altar call, you say, Pastor, I'm just not telling anybody about Jesus. Oh, I talk about the weather and sports and all the fun things of my life, but I don't share Jesus with anyone. Matter of fact, it's been, it's been months since I've ever even testified for the Lord. But today, I realize it's my responsibility. It's my spiritual obligation to make sure my friends, my co-workers, everyone around me knows that there's a Jesus that's coming back. And today I want to recommit my life to Christ to make sure that I get the message out. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Thank you, friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Both of my hands are up. I'm a preacher and my hands are up. Hallelujah. God help me. Help me share more about Jesus than I have ever before. Hallelujah. Let's all stand together. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I'd like you all to say this prayer with me. Whether you raise your hand or not, I'd like you to say this prayer with me. 
Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I invite you to come into my heart. I invite you to come into my heart. To be the Lord of my life. To be the Lord of my life. Be King Jesus. Be King Jesus. On the throne of my life. On the throne of my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For the sacrifice. Yes. Of your shed blood. Your shed blood. On Calvary Street. I confess with my lips. That Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I'm sorry, Lord, if I moved away from you. I renew my vow to live for you all the days of my life. Help me, Jesus. Give me the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the boldness of Almighty God to share Christ with this world. I thank you for it, God. Help me live a life that is worthy of your calling. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Can we give our, our Lord praise today? So go do it. Go do it. In the name of Jesus, just go do it. Tell people about Jesus. Have a great Sunday, church. God bless you.